Hey, what's up, everybody? Marcos Viegas. Welcome to another edition of this Fight of TV interview show, recap show. I don't know. It's still a uh, a work in progress, but in progress, that is. Speaking of progress, moved into a new spot. Um, mine, that's why the background looks a little bit different. It's all white and plain uh, and everything, but building out kind of like a mini, mini uh, Fight Hub studio. Uh, a lot of more good things to come. Uh, I hope to bring you guys different types of content. Uh, with this move, but let's go ahead and, and, and touch on the action that happened over the weekend. Uh, mind uh, the uh, the fights. It was kind of light on action. There's two fights mainly that happened uh, over the weekend. Jared Anderson uh, going to a decision against Charles Martin and uh, Savannah Marshall beating Fan Sean Cruz. Now, I, I miss the Savannah Marshall fight, uh, but she won via unanimous decision. Uh, and, and you would imagine the, uh, the the big fight for her, the, the rivalry is her and Clarissa Shields, uh, th their first fight, uh, i got to admit, man, uh, that first fight was fire. I, li I like that fight, so I, I like that rematch. And, and I saw a few vid uh, videos of, of Clarissa um, uh, on YouTube from uh, some of the English outlets. So uh, you would imagine like the, the story is starting to build even more for like a rivalry. Like I, I think this is like her, 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 I don't know, it, it might be her signature rivalry with somebody because she's so much like just levels ahead of everybody uh, in terms of her game uh, is Clarissa Shields. But Charles Martin uh, going 10 rounds with um, Jared Big Baby Anderson, someone who, you know, not not who. It was, uh, I believe, top rank in ESPN labeled Jared Anderson the next great American heavyweight. But people were going in on Jared Anderson uh, going 12 rounds with uh, Charles Martin. Uh, you know, I would imagine when you have that label as the next great American heavyweight, People expect you to dispatch people like Charles Martin. Now, uh, I, I might develop this into a segment. Uh, who knows? I call it double take. You know, I'm going to give uh, the, the pro take and then the negative take, all right? So uh, the negative take is, dude, Charles Martin, come on, bro. Like, a guy like Jared Anderson, when people like Tyson Fury just ex put this, not a, not on a, put him on a pedestal, but pedestal, I can't even talk, pedestal. But when they have such high praise for you, the expectations are a guy like Charles Martin, who's, you know, I don't know. And you guys can let me know if you guys classify him as, as a journeyman uh, at this point. But he is a, a former heavyweight champion, though. The way he won that title uh, was under, you know, kind of like, eh, the, the guy hurt his knee. Uh, it was a, a, in New York and he became champion. And then he went into the Joshua fight uh, and Joshua knocked him out in, in uh, two rounds. And, and he's been, uh, you know, Martin's a guy that's fought top tier competition he, Joshua off the top of my head uh Luis Ortiz I, I think he dropped Ortiz or, or he got stopped but you know people were expecting Jared Anderson to knock out someone like that because not much stock is given into Charles Martin anymore people are saying he's, he's not that good on the flip side look when Martin went into that uh, Joshua fight he was all over the place you know that the whole I'm a god among men after the fight and him going a little loopy uh for that year and him you know I believe he was arrested in LA with possession or, or something, something to do with, they stopped him at like five in the morning. Uh, so late at night uh, and they snatched him. He's going through all sorts of problems. Okay. Uh, it seemed uh, the last time I actually had a conversation with Charles Martin was maybe about eight months ago where he told me he he was in a good place mentally. Uh, he had everything together and uh, that he's finally happy and he was training hard. And I think that that showed in a way against uh, Luis Ortiz on the, no idea why Fox put that side track. Why would you put a pay per view on on? I, I know this, this is like last year, or maybe even longer, but one of the worst ideas ever to put a pay per view show on uh, January first. It's, it's come on, really. Uh, but he looked pretty decent in that fight with Luis Ortiz. Uh, people might say, "Hey, you know, Ortiz is like fifty years old," but people have been saying that about Ortiz for the longest time. Um, with that said. On the flip side of this double take, the, the pro side is, is that, look, Charles Martin leveled up. He actually has been doing pretty, pretty well uh, in there, uh, in fights and in camps. He got his life together. He's focused. And, and he brought that all out against Jared Anderson. Look, and Charles Martin is, is believe he had the longer reach. He had a lot of natural uh, abilities, you know. Give this guy a break. He's only 23. He's still developing. You know, that showed... That fight showed 
that he can't be a world champion because he was met with adversity. He did do adjustments from time to time in there uh, as well. Overall, let's kind of pump the brakes a little bit. Let's see how he looks in the next fight, uh, Jared Anderson. But, you know, if you compare what others have done, especially Joshua against Charles Martin, it becomes a hard sell now to sell him as the next great American heavyweight. And I don't even think Jared even likes that label. He doesn't care for it at all. He told us in the interview that I had with him uh, two weeks ago that he doesn't care for that as, uh, uh, at all. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how how he is in these next uh, few years because he has a plan. He wants to get out as soon as he can out of boxing. And he, he doesn't mince words about it. He's been real clear and transparent. He doesn't like boxing. He does it because he's good at it. Uh, and he wants to make as much money as he can. And, and once he reaches a certain uh, goal, a financial goal, he's out. He's out, um, which makes you think, hey, does he have one foot in, one foot out? Uh, is, is he really focused? Uh, how is he going to be in, in fights where, yes, he's he's earned a good amount of money and he's going to think to himself, and this is hypothetical, hey, is it worth it taking more punches? I'm pretty comfortable now. I have a good amount of money. You know, Do I really want to bite down and, and do this? Um, so I say, let, let's kind of, you know, relax, relax. Kid's young, a lot of potential. Shoddy's freaking good. He's, he's good. Yes. Uh, everybody develops at different rates. So me personally, I just, before we, we throw all this on him, let's see how he does with the next, uh, opponent. Okay. Like the guys that he fought before, also menos. Eh, so, so Charles Martin was the first guy that actually had a good resume, uh, that's had some great experience and that experience showed in this fight as well. Uh, but you know, Hey, he was, uh, Jared Anderson was over, uh, able to overcome that. So light on the action, uh, over the weekend, uh, big news, Canelo, uh, announcing that he's fighting Jamil Charlo. What the heck? That's, you know, I think I'm going to do a separate thing on this, uh, to be honest, because there's pros and cons to this. And you know, what? I'll, I'll just gloss them over quickly because, uh, we're going to have Virgil Ortiz on and Edgar Berlang on. I, I, I should have probably said this in the beginning. Edgar Berling on the show today. Virgil Ortiz Jr. on the show today. Teddy Atlas on the show today. So uh, stay tuned for that. Let me just get this out quick so we can go to Virgil. Um, another double take. Canelo fighting Jermel Charlo. The positive, the pro. Uh, he's fighting the better Charlo. The one that's undisputed. Uh, moving from 154 to 168. Could do Charlo well. He could be even stronger at that weight. Uh, because, man... Do you see the last win that Charlo did uh, against uh, Castaño? He looked like a skeleton, man. That that was a tough weight cut. And, and you see his twin, uh, Jermall, uh, is filled out pretty well at 168. They, they're big guys, man. They're twins. So uh, maybe this extra weight uh, will do him well. I, I, honestly, I believe he's naturally around 170. Um, I, it's been told to me by people. Uh, I think not by people. By I think Eddie uh, Reynoso told me this one time. When Canelo's not training, he's around 175, 185. So they're near the same size, to be honest. So, yes, I do uh, understand when people say, look, it's two freaking weight classes he's coming up. But maybe this is is one of those instances that Jermel will actually be stronger moving up in weight. On the pros, uh, on the flip side, on the negative side, I just said it. Yo, you, David Benavides was available. And you chose Jermel? Wait, whoa. David even said he was a fan. Wow. What the hell? That, that's a bigger fight, right? That's a bigger fight. Um, that's the other thing I was thinking. I've seen tweets. And, of course, the one that I just mentioned. Look, dog. You find a 154 guy? Yeah, I understand context of that. Jamal wasn't, wasn't ready. He, he did that live with uh, Demetrius Andrade where he said – he wouldn't be ready for 168. He's going through some personal things. Um, and uh, his little brother, his twin, Jermel, stepped up. I, you know, those are the two two flip uh, of the coin. Um, I rarely don't give my opinion because uh, I don't know. I, I've never really liked it. I like giving both sides of an argument and letting you guys decide. Uh, but I will say this. Yo, you got to give Jermel freaking props, dog. For reals. This guy got some... Balls the size of Texas, bro. He's, dude, when you look at it, this is not a bad opponent for Canelo. Jermel's freaking good. He's undisputed champion, dog. Come on. Like this, I, I think this is going to be a tough fight for him. 
it's gonna be a hard fight for him. It's it's not like he's fighting a John Ryder, uh, some you know whatever guy. This is Jermel Charlo, dude, undisputed champion, undefeated. Uh, well, technically he has that loss to Harrison, but he he won that fight. He won the fight. Come on, uh, technically he has that loss, but t- to me he's undefeated still. With that said, though, man. We'll see. This was the the plot twist of the year. Uh, Canelo choosing to fight Jermel Charlo. Uh, the 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 face off is going to be intense because a lot of people feel that Mel is the mean uh, brother, the more like locked in, uh, focused uh, one out of the two. And, and look, man, Jermel's had a hell of a run, and if he's able to pull this off, oh my god, undisputed in two divisions. Jesus, what an accomplishment that would be uh, for Mel. But we'll, we'll get more into that uh, on another episode, or I might just kind of do a, a side episode uh, in regards to that topic. Right? To me, honestly, honestly, I think it's a great fight. I think it's a great fight. And people saying all that other, the negative stuff, you guys do have a valid point. But, it, you know, it, it's not like he's fighting someone bad. He's fighting an undisputed champion who's, Pretty damn good, all right? With that being said, man, let's go ahead and roll in Virgil Ortiz in here now uh, and, and talk to him about his fight this coming weekend. I, I chatted with him um, about this fight, about uh, Spence and Crawford, and, and a few other things. So let's go ahead and get to uh, Virgil Ortiz. Let's go. It's, yeah, it's uh, we've been through a whole journey. And, uh, and you know, it's because I don't know if I'm talking, you know, to you or talking to the audience, so I, I got to make sure. But anyways, yeah, it's been a long journey. Um I'm I'm real excited, you know. I'm happy how camp went, and uh, I'm just I'm excited to get back into the ring. You know, speaking about uh, the camp, uh, what changes ha- have you made? So nothing happened, so everything goes smooth. I would imagine everything has been going smooth, but you know this this condition, the rhabdo flared up, and that's why you had to push this fight back. So what changes did you guys have to make so that doesn't happen again? So, you know, right right after it happened, uh, we went straight to a doctor and we immediately started, uh, I want to say, like, a recovery camp because I was literally in Fresno uh, with uh, Dr. Bautista doing recovery every day, twice a day, um, doing stuff like um, uh, IVs and we're doing oxygen therapy and uh, red light therapy. And with some of the stuff we were hitting, like, all three at the same time, you know, and we were doing cryo stuff. And we just implemented, you know, pretty much most of that stuff into my into my everyday lifestyle, and uh, that's just what's been keeping me, uh, you know, feeling good every day. And you know, after every sparring sessions, I've been doing like ice baths, and uh, you know, I used to hate ice baths. Now, you know, now now they make me feel good, and I can I can get in with no problem. Um, you know, we hyperbaric uh, oxygen chamber therapy, and all that stuff, and we just. Which is, I know it's, it's a lot of stuff, but this is just everything that I do now. And j- just to make sure that I can hit it hard again the next day. Mm. Wow, I, I didn't know. Like, How long was that treatment process to like get cleared and be okay? It was It was about a full month. Full month it was about a full stuff. month. Wow. Yes. Um, you know, I was reading it was caused the flare-up by long COVID, which yes. got me thinking, are you fine on that end? Like, is the long COVID like out of your system now? Um, to long, I don't know if you can get long COVID out of your system. Uh, you know, it's like I'm not a doctor. I can't. I yeah. can't really. I don't. I don't know. Like, I don't know. But what I do know is, I, I believe we got it under control, and uh, we're do, we're doing a uh, 110 percent to to keep it that way. And we're 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 just doing everything we can to make sure that I'm healthy. You know, was there any part in, in the two postponements uh, with the flare up and then the the first case um, that you you felt like, man, my career might be over? Like, was it? Did it ever get to a point where you're like, shit, like I don't I don't know if I'm gonna be able to fight anymore? Um, I mean, it's I've definitely had people tell me that, and uh, I say it's something you don't want to think about, but you know, it's it's something that that can stick in, in the back of your mind, but m- mostly. I just thought of it as another obstacle. You know, I've gone through many obstacles in my life, uh, many challenges, and I just, I just thought of it that way. You know, this is just a challenge that, uh, 
that I'm going to have to figure out a solution to that I'm going to have to, you know, take down. And I believe that I believe we're doing that. I believe we've done a good job. Is there still like a, a part of you that's kind of like, I don't know, I just, I just got to get through this day. I just got to get through tomorrow. I just got to get through these two weeks and, and I'll finally feel like, yes, I'm finally in the clear. Like this is actually going to happen. Like, is there any, any part of, of kind of like walking on eggshells from like now till the fight? So as far as uh, as far as you saying it, like, oh, I just got to get through this week or whatever. No, I, I don't. I can't. I can't say that I think like that at all. That's. I feel like to me that's almost a loser mentality, and that's that's just not how I am. You know, just just saying, oh, just one more day, just one more day, just one more week. You know, that's just. It's like that that famous Muhammad Ali quote. Like you don't you don't count the days. You make the days count. You know, so that's that's just how I've been going about it. You know, we're just, we're making the most out of it every day, recovering, uh, training, just just doing the best that I can, uh, in in every aspect of my life. So that's just, that's just how I've been taking it. As far as eggshells, no. If anything, um, sometimes they have to to calm me down because I'm I, I want to let loose, like hey, like hey, you know. But I, eggshells, no, like. Fuck the egg show, you know. I'm making, I'm making whatever school we need to say, you know, with those egg shows, you know? <laughs> Little Vienna sausages, little little cut up wings. Yeah, you know, bro. <laughs> Did you have you had that as breakfast as a food growing up? Oh, that was the best, bro. That, that's hands down. That's the best right there, man. Oh man, tortillas with butter, tortillas with a little slice of ham. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's up. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, I I brought that last part up uh, because. Um, and uh, some people are super uh, superstitious and, and it kind of like hangs with them and they're kind of like, ah, like, hey, you say I'm good, but it's still in the back of my mind because this has happened like twice before. So I was I, I don't know if you are superstitious, but I know a, a similar situation happened in the UFC where uh, I, I believe it was Habib and Tony Ferguson. And everyone was saying, like, dude, this fight is cursed. Something always happens. Someone always something always happens that it, that it puts the fight off. Even the fighters were like, oh, man, like I I kind of feel like this huge weight on my shoulder until we. We, I step into the ring. Yeah, um, I didn't feel anything like that at all, honestly. Uh, I knew this fight, in my heart, I knew this fight was eventually going to happen. Even before the fight was going to be made, I just, I just knew that this was an inevitable matchup. It, it, was, it was bound to happen. So I, I, had a lot of, I had a lot of faith that it was going to happen. I mean, there's, there's really nothing else to it. I wasn't worried about that at all. Mm. You know, looking at the fight, bro, what do you what do you think is gonna happen in the fight? Because fans are excited for it. I'm excited for it, just knowing your style and his style. But what do you think happens and will happen in the fight? Well, without predicting any wins or anything like that, or how it's gonna, how you know, wh whatever. I think it's gonna be a real action packed fight. I think that the the fans are the fans' eyes are gonna be glued to the fight. There's not gonna be a dull moment. You know, it's it's a it's a fight that. I want to watch again the next day. Well, I want to relive it, watching it, you know, and uh, I want to watch it as a fan first. That's, that's what I do with all my fights. I watch it as a fan first. And then, you know, you start calculating, okay, so where, where did I fuck up here? What could I have done better? But it's, um, I'm really excited for it. I'm excited for the fans. Uh, I'm excited just, just to bring it, you know. This is what boxing's about, you know. Mm. I want to be a part of the best fights. Is uh, Stanionis an opponent that you feel is going to bring something out of you that we haven't seen before? Has him as an opponent, just see, seeing him, what, what he brings to the table style-wise, has it caused you to, to to push that much more because of, of what he is as a fighter at all? Uh, we won't, I won't really know that until I'm in the ring. You know, it's uh, that's definitely not something that I can turn off and on. It's really kind of up to them. So, uh, I mean... Does he have the potential to? I mean, you know, possibly. Um, it's 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 a tough fight overall, you know, man. You know, so. Mm. Do you, given like his opponents and given yours, you're obviously the more experienced uh, fighter. You fought in fighters uh, that have a lot of experience, also as well. Do you think this is like a big jump up in competition for him? Um. I mean, it's it's hard to say without making myself feel big headed, you know. Um, so I, I guess I would just have to say respectfully, probably. You know, I think I am his hardest fight on paper. I guess you could say. 
uh, yeah, I guess so. You know, both you guys have been waiting for this fight. Uh, the in inactivity level, I know it sounds cliche, and you guys have training camps to kind of, you know, get the rust off, uh, the timing off, uh, and all that. Uh, but does it play a factor at all for either of you in this fight, you feel? I don't think so, because, I mean, we've – we we're, we've been in training camp. We've been sparring and stuff, and it's uh, as far as ring rust goes. I mean, the only difference between the fights and the sparring is you know we don't we're wearing smaller gloves and we're we're not wearing headgears. So yeah, the punches you know they feel a little different, but overall it's 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 kind of the same thing. You know, when when you're in a fight, you do what you've been doing the whole training camp. So I mean, it's you know you don't necessarily do what you did the last fight. You're doing what you did recently, which is so I don't. I don't think it, it's going to matter that much. Mm. Uh, this is for one of the WBA titles, so um, you've been in line for multiple sanctioning bodies. Seeing that you know Spence and Crawford are, are fighting to become undisputed, and there's a rematch clause. Have you thought about like what what happens at that point? Are you going to have to have a few more fights until you get your shot? Like, have you had any sort of thoughts or indication about how that's all going to shake out? I've had thoughts. I, um, any indications? No, we don't. We don't really know what's going to go on. Um, there's just there's just so many options. There's just so many ways that it can play out. You know, do you know there's a rematch clause? You know, what if they don't? I don't know. What if, what if it's a freaking draw? And then they just they fight again and then they fight again they fight just again, to see yeah, who really fight. won. You know, so we, we don't know. Man. That's just that's just how much he is. You know, so what if we get another Pacquiao Marquez like fuck another four or five fights? Like we we just don't know. <laughs> We don't, we don't know, and uh, we, we just have to play by ear. That's mm. really all we can do. So you have been giving thoughts then. Um, oh, yeah, does, for sure. Does, does it get to a point then that, like, you just move up to 154? I would say we get there when we get there. Uh, of course, I will move up to 154 at some point. I guess it's just a matter of when. Um, like I said, this is, this is, this is just all – options that we don't know yet we don't mm. we just don't know yeah you know the the other thing um i was thinking too it's like well does he have to get to a point then that he knocks out one of these other guys that are trying to to vie for contention like a, a Jaron ennis or, or something like that so kind of like all right you you guys stop because i want my place and like hey he was supposed to be a, the other guy that wanted the shot and i i dispatched him so like now like it doesn't matter who it is it's it's me that has to get the shot you know, and you would think it would work like that in a perfect world, but you know, a lot some people get title shots and they're not even like in the top five or even in the top ten sometimes. So it's just like that that's supposed to happen, but it you know, a lot of times it doesn't happen. Um, so you, you can't even when it's playing by the rules, it's not played like that. You know, you, you would think it would go like that, but sometimes it doesn't. So we can't really rely on, on people following the rules or anything like that. So it's just like, like I said, we just have to play by ear. That's just how we've always done it. And we'll just take every opportunity as it comes. We'll make the most out of it. Uh, I've asked you uh, this before in the past um, about, you know, what do you think about the Spence and Crawford fight? But I'm, I'm going to kind of do a different angle. Who is it better for you to win that fight between Spence and Crawford? If I'm being realistic, uh, first of all, I don't care who wins. But if, if you're asking me from, like, I don't know. I, I would have to say Spence just because we're from, you know, we came out of the same gym. Uh, we're from the same area. Dude, we'd, we'd sell out the Cowboys Stadium. Easy. Mm. That'd be crazy, man. You ever think you, you'd, you'd ever get to that point? <laughs> you're like, you're pretty close to doing stuff. Like I mean, that. I, I hope so. I, I, I really do. I, I hope I hope so. I'm I'm, I'm very optimistic. Mm. Jeez, imagine that. Or Spence versus Ortiz, AT and T Stadium, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand people. That'd be nuts. That's crazy. Ten minutes from my house, dude. That'd be that'd be insane. <laughs> you know, it, it prompts me to ask. Like, regardless of what happens, you said you know you are eventually going to move to one fifty four, but um, realistically, you're still able to make the weight pretty comfortably, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I would imagine what one more year, two more years, three more years at the weight. Um, I would say three years is out of out of the question. Um, yeah. but 
one or two more years, I, I could definitely see that happening. Mm. I just want to touch a little bit on um, the last few fights you've had. Uh, I, I know um, you like to look back at your fights. Where do you feel that you're different as a fighter now compared to maybe two fights ago that you've pinpointed a thing that you feel like, you know what, I really improved in this area up until this point? Uh, two fights ago, that was what, me Machine? Um That's, that's kind of a hard one. Um, that's a real hard one because I felt I did really good that fight. <laughs> 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 I mean, you, you know, uh, besides like, you know, the second round or whatever. But I thought I thought that was a, a pretty good performance by me. What, what did I do wrong in that fight? You know, there was a lot of punches where I, I shot from the outside and I got caught. Um, that, that, that's a real hard one. That, that's that, that's kind of it's kind of hard to put it into words. Like I feel it, mm -hmm. but I I don't to say it to the to the audience how they would uh, understand it. It's kind of hard. Like I like I would kind of say like I can kind of see, I can, I can kind of see where uh, not necessarily the openings, but the way I can kind of see the way better. I get my punches in a little more clearly. Like I kind of, I see better now. Like, like I got boxing LASIK or something, you know, like I can, I can see where, where things are going to land and like maybe not, not try too hard. And it's, it's, you know, just making it a little more accessible. Everything's a little more accessible now, I would say. You, you uh, flow better. You think better. Timing. Your timing's better. I wouldn't say that's timing. Oh. Mm. No, that's it, it, it's, it's not a timing thing. It, it's just recognizing. I guess You're recognizing. Like a, a, awareness. Your ring awareness. Awareness. There you go. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, it's, go ahead. It, it's kind of a hard thing to, yeah. you know, just to put in the words. I mean, there's a specific word for a specific way to say it. But I, I think awareness is as close as you'll get. I, I bring that up because I, I would imagine uh, Stanionis uh, might be looking at that fight and thinking, hey, there, there's things here I could work with. Um, others have suggested that, hey, it, could it be a similar fight style-wise, Stanionis and, and Mean Machine? What do you make of that? I mean, that's... I don't really see any... They're similar in some ways but not they're not as similar as you think they are you know uh like i said it, it's kind of hard to put in the words but it they're they're two completely different fighters you know some people see yeah they both like to come forward right but it's it's just the way they go about it you know to to an to a person who doesn't watch boxing all the time or isn't like a big time fan they're gonna see two go forward fighters and think they fight the same well that's not always the case you know some people pressure but you know, kind of stick stick on the outside, and you know they can apply pressure, but from the outside or whatever. Some people just straight up brawl. Some people go in defensively, you know, not not defensively smart. Some people do. Um, so there's just there's just like a a bunch of different styles, but you know they branch off from, into different things. You know, I'm kind of nerding it up right now, but that's just that's just how it is. Like, I don't think they're the same fighters at all. It, just to answer your question. Mm, mm. Okay, so th that's a bad comparison some fans are, are, are making then. I, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I think maybe they're, like, mistaking it because they they both come from, like, Eastern Europe and they do have, like, aggressive the styles. Same country. Yeah, 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 you know, so I, I think, like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of similarities there, but, yeah, that's interesting, man, that you, you don't feel they're kind of the same. They're, they're not the same, you know, it's just, yeah, they're, like I said, they're both, uh, no, they they can be aggressive fighters, but they're, they're not the same at all. Mm, mm. No, given how this camp has gone, Virgil, um, what are you expecting out of yourself, bro, in, in this fight? Shit, I'm, I'm expecting, uh, well, what the fans can expect is, you know, the, the same, the same guy, you know, the, the, how do I say? Some people say that I'm, I'm one day I'm going to be, you know, the best. And hopefully, you know, I, I've always said, hopefully that's the case, you know, God willing, everything goes great. But I want to put those, those thoughts, those hopes and dreams back into their minds, you know, like, and like out there, God, you know, I've, I've been inactive and uh, that obviously it's not 
my choice. I, I would fight, you know, four times a year if I could. But I just, I just want to remind everyone that, that I'm still here. Mm. Yeah, that's what I was uh, kind of thinking too. Like, hey, I wonder, I don't know if you're putting pressure on yourself, but I wonder if there is pressure to kind of just remind people like, yo, I'm, I'm this dude. Like, I'm back. Like, look at what I did. Like, look at this performance I had. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say there's any pressure at all. Uh, you know, I get asked that question a lot. And it's, it's, uh, it's weird how I answer it. Like, it's always the same answer. And it's no. And it's not like, I'm not saying like, oh, yeah, just stop asking this question. But it's just like, I don't feel any pressure at all. You know, and uh, it's pretty... I don't think I felt pressure at all. Maybe, maybe except for like, I think I had more pressure in my driving test than any of my boxing fights. I swear to God, you know, that's, <laughs> I think that's like one of really the only few times I felt pressure. Cause I was like, fuck, I just learned parallel parking. Like oh my God. <laughs> what, what I, what I thought was parallel parking, bro. Uh, I was practicing it for like two weeks or so. And I was doing it forward. I didn't know you had to do it backwards. So like literally. Wait, wait, wait. So you were going like, oh. in forward like that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, no. I was doing it by myself. I was doing it yeah. by myself until I was just like, you know what? Let me, let me look at a video. You yeah, know, I was gonna know, say you didn't bother to YouTube that. I did the day before, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was just like, oh fuck, like I think I'm gonna fail this. But oh, I, I did it. I, I, I went to the the practice thing where you practice it because they had the cones out there for anyone to practice it. And I, I mean, I did it. It wasn't too hard. Uh, granted, there was a lot of space, but. I got it down, but I still felt the pressure, man. But you know, back to boxing, I don't feel pressure like that. That's just like, okay, I was born to do this. You know, this is what I'm made for. This is what I trained every day of my life for. So I don't feel any pressure because I know I'm, I know I'm gonna do what I gotta do. That's funny, man. The, the headline's gonna be um, <laughs> Virgil Ortiz feels more pressure parallel parking than in boxing matches. <laughs> 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 you know, granted, uh, parallel parking could be a stressful thing when there's not a lot of room. <laughs> That's for <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Virgil, on, on uh, just a funny ending note, man, uh, I, I was looking through your Twitter um, and I, I saw uh, you retweet a thing about, um, I believe, Elon Musk. <laughs> are, are you siding with Elon Musk on this, this little Zuckerberg Musk drama that's happening? Uh, man, I don't know. From what I'm seeing, I think that uh, Mark Zuckerberg might might have the edge on him. You know, I feel like he might actually have the reach on him. Um, it looks like he's actually been training. I mean, we haven't seen anything from, uh, you know, oh, uh, Elon Musk. I don't even think he's in fighting shape. So who who whoever gasses out first is, is going <laughs> to lose. Yeah, that, if that fight happens, man, ah, oh, my God, that that – one, it'll be the biggest fight of all time, I, I I think. But it's just crazy that like something like that would even happen, you know? It's crazy, and it all started with the whole KSI Logan Paul thing. If we're being honest, you know, I mean, it brought to mind. Uh, it brought it brought a lot of you know criticism as well. But I mean, like as long as people are taking the interest, if I look look at it like this, bro, like when when people have beef. You don't say, oh, let's 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 settle it with the with the basketball game or a football game. No, let's let's fight. You know, that's that's how people want to do it. You know, so at the end of the day, it's it's who's gonna beat whose ass. You know, and that's kind of gets the respect or whatever, you know. But uh that I kind of take pride in boxing because of that. Cause you know, it's just like, you know what, like at the end of the day, you you want to see who's who's the better fighter. Yeah, man, that that's how the the noble way of settling beef is to uh you know duke it out inside either a uh, ring or a uh, a cage man um exactly and um and it's it's the bond that you get after that you know if you as you if you've watched boxing which i know you have but you, you see uh fighters like hey like respect each other after that like hey we just duked it out we just we just do punches at each other and now nah, we're we're good dude like that's that's amazing you know if I've never fought one of my friends before, but I know a lot of people have become friends because they fought each other. You know, it's just, it's just a, it's, it's a bonding experience if we're being honest, you know? So it's just kind of a weird bonding experience that when you really think about it, like, Hey, how'd you guys yeah. bond? like, Oh yeah, we beat the crap out of each other. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's just how it is. And it's crazy. You know, that's, that's how guys are. That's, That's how guys are. That's how guys are, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, uh, Virgil, man, um, thank you for the time, bro. I, I appreciate it. 
Um, I, I can't wait for this fight, man. I, I really think this is going to be probably one of the the best fights uh, uh, of the year. And uh, I know uh, fans are expecting you and uh, Stan Jonas to give one hell of a fight, man. If you want to go ahead and close out this interview and, and let fans know uh, just any final messages uh, that you have for them. Yeah, man. So uh, I just want to say thank you to all the fans that have been sticking up for me and uh, supporting throughout, you know, this whole um, dilemma I've been having. You know, it, it's been a long time coming, but I promise that uh, I'm going to make it up to you July 8th. It's, it's going to be a good one. You're not going to want to miss it. It'll be like I was never gone. July 8th, it goes down. This man right here, Virgil Ortiz, taking on Imantis Stagnonis on uh, the zone in San Antonio. Uh, Virgil, I wish you uh, the very best. I'll see you uh, at the fight. And uh, I hope one day you get to open up that uh, coffee shop as well. Thank you so much, Virgil. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. That was Virgil Ortiz, who fights this coming weekend, this Saturday, uh, in San Antonio uh, against Imantis Stagnonis. Uh, man, that, that's going to be a firefight, man. Just knowing both of their styles. Um, Virgil's a come forward, aggressive guy. Huge, huge punch. Uh, I believe he has 100% uh, KO ratio uh, going against uh, Imantis Tanyonis, another guy who's undefeated, who uh, likes to come forward uh, and throw down. I don't know if it's going to be a uh, like a potential... I don't know. Maybe I take that back. Maybe it could be potentially fight of the year. Uh, my thing is, I don't think... Stanion is given how heavy handed of a puncher Virgil is these exchanges that, that could happen. I don't think they're going to last for very long because either, or it might taste some power and think, Hey, you know what? I, I, I need to back off. I need to calm down a little bit, rethink, regroup and, and do this a different way because there's a high probability that I can get uh, hurt really badly or uh, knocked out. But I'd say there's a lot of implications for this fight. It's a title fight, even though we know the, the real title and, it's just the WBA has so many freaking titles, man. Uh, the super champion, regular champion, interim champion. Uh, and that's just boxing as a whole. They have so many uh, champions uh, with the, their belt rankings and systems. But this is a title fight. Uh, and the winner's mandated to fight uh, the winner of uh, this Errol Spence versus Terrence Crawford fight. Uh, everybody in, in those uh, mandatory positions for the belts are, are slated to fight the, the winner. And I think uh, once the series of these fights, and even... You know, the, the rematch between Spence and Crawford could maybe even end up being not for Undisputed. Uh, when we get into the rematch, they might drop, the winner might drop some of the belts to kind of avoid these mandatories. Uh, and, and we start seeing uh, these other cats uh, getting elevated to full full titles or uh, into fights with each other. Um, and we don't even know if the rematch is going to happen at 147 pounds or if they opt to uh, do it at 154 pounds. But uh, my man, Virgil Ortiz... Uh, fighting this weekend, July 9th on Dazen, the zone. Um, sorry, did I say July 9th? July 8th in, in uh, San Antonio at the uh, AT&T Center. I'll be there. Uh, we'll have full coverage on that fight. Uh, but speaking of another cat man that's uh, coming off of a uh, win, uh, we have Edgar, Edgar Berlanga on the show coming up. I did this interview with him um, was a few days ago, so mind the uh, different background, uh, different shirt, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, but we had a lot to chat about. We talked about uh, his performance against Jason Quigley, um, what the future may hold, uh, some criticism towards uh, him not being able to knock out Jason Quigley and what came with that. Hey, look, he's still hopeful for a Canelo fight, which I found surprising. You know, I, that's the main question uh, that I had in my, in my mind with this whole Canelo news uh, when he made this uh, three fight deal with PBC was, wait a second. The whole reason why Berlanga signed with Matchroom was to get that Canelo fight, but um, he, he's still hopeful that that fight still happens. We touch on that and uh, many, many other things. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and roll the clip and uh, get to our interview with Edgar Berlanga. Now being joined with the still undefeated Edgar Berlanga, who we saw in action recently against Jason Quigley. Edgar, man. Uh, how are you doing? And what did you think about uh, the performance you had against uh, Jason Quigley, man? Um, I'm doing good, man. Um, I think it was uh, an amazing night. You know, um, I definitely ended the fight off the way I wanted it to. You know, I, I wish I would have uh, caught the stoppage in the 12th. That would have been over. The, that would have been crazy. You know, we would have definitely shook the roof off of off, off the garden, man. But, uh, you know, I caught two amazing knockdowns in the last round. Um, 
And I definitely feel like at this phase that, you know, I still could withhold my power in the 12th round and the later rounds. Now, you, you mentioned something very interesting in the post-fight press conference. Uh, you said, like, hey, man, when, when people fight me, they, they like – and you said you experienced this ever since the ma uh, the amateurs. When they fight me, they fight different. Like, they level up because yeah. they know about the power. Like, they can't mess around. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, with that being said, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, just combing through social media, a lot of people are like, oh, you should have put out a Quigley. But, you know, I was watching the fight. This is the best fight that Quigley's ever fought, I feel yeah. like, in his entire For sure. career. For sure, the best, man. Um, And he, he said it, you know. I believe he made a post, and he said, I gave it my all. And that right there was like, you know, the light bulb went off in my head. I was like, you see what I'm saying? Like, I know this guy, man. Like, that's why I never psyched myself out. I never fell for the hype. I never fell for the media of, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the betting, you know, that was like negative 1500 for, for TKO or, or knockout. Like, I was like, now this guy's coming to fight. I kept telling myself in camp, like, and that's why I took this fight so serious because I said, this dude's coming to fight. Like, He's coming the strongest he's ever been. He's coming the smartest he's ever been. You know, he's coming to boxes, the, the best boxing he's ever did before. And that's exactly what he did. You know, I got the best Jason Quigley uh, on, on Saturday, June 24th. Yeah, props to uh, Andy Lee because, yeah, you could tell it, it made a difference uh, for Quigley in the fight, even though uh, you scored four knockdowns. I, I noticed he landed a hook on you. Uh, were yeah. you stunned at all when he landed that hook? Um, yeah, I wasn't like hurt or nothing, but it was a good shot. You know, he landed clean. Um, but I feel like I responded right away. You know, I got hit and I, you know, shook it off and I just kept it going. You know, I don't feel like he did anything to me where, you know, it changed the momentum of the fight. You know, he just caught me with a good shot. You know, it happens in boxing. Um, you know, I feel like the shot that he hit me with, I was just lazy on my defense, you know, had my hands down. Um, but you know, like the world knows, you know, I could take a shot. You know, that was a flush shot right on the chin. Um, you know, for me, I just shook it off, and it, it's a part of boxing. You know, you're gonna get hit. Um, it's not you're gonna get hit with shots. Um, you know, you just gotta know. I guess I don't know. Just hope and pray for the better, and pray that you know you got a fucking chin. You know, because if you don't, then you're gonna hit the canvas. But you know, I I feel like I've been tested already. Um, you know, previous, you know, my previous fight. You know, obviously with with Cosette is when I got dropped, came back up. Um, but you know, I got I got a chin, man. Like I, I know I could take a punch. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not. I'm not in the business to take punches, you know. But it comes with the territory. He's boxing, you know. So I know I was gonna get hit. It's just you know, just how to, you know, how you gonna get hit? How you gonna respond? Yeah, that, I think that's like one of the biggest misconceptions, like in the sport. Like for all the, like for how defensive you can be, like you're gonna get hit. It's boxing. Yeah. Like you're gonna yeah. get hit, and you're gonna get hit a lot. Maybe not as much as like other people, but like you're gonna get hit. It's boxing. Like that's the name of the yeah, game. You, sure. you get hit. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, you know, I know it's hitting, don't get hit, you know, but uh listen, man, you find a twelve round fight, you know, you're gonna get hit. Like you're it's not you're not gonna not get hit. You're gonna get hit. Um, just you gotta be prepared, you know, and make sure that, you know, you can't even train your chin to to, to take a punch. You know, it's either you got it or you don't. It's either you can take a punch or you can't take a punch, you know, and uh you know, you just gotta get tested. You know, I feel like I got tested already, you know. So me just taking that shot. Um, I feel like I took it very well. Um, you know, it, it, it didn't bother me or anything. You know, I took the shot and kept it going. So the future, man, uh, there's a lot of fights that are there yeah. for you. But you mentioned it in your post fight. I, I, I think a, a fight that I I would bet money on this, that it would end up being fight of the year and we could potentially see a knockout of the year. You and Jaime Munguia would be a freaking tremendous fight. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people's in the talks about that too, you know, uh, but, you know, they thinking that the Canelo thing is like dying out because he's in PBC, but, you know, you got Canelo there too that, that we can still make happen, you know, that just because he went over to, to PBC or whatnot and, you know, signed with a deal with Al Heyman for three fights, you know, we got that power, you know, with my management and, you know, obviously Eddie that, you know, we could definitely cross over with, with the network and we could, possibly get a fight on Showtime pay-per-view, you know, with Canelo, you know, so not just Munguia, you know, you got Canelo, you got, you know, Belovkin, you got these type of guys, man, that's out there right now, you know, but um, I'm just, you know, right now I'm just, I'm the fighter, you know, and my team knows best, my team knows who to put in front of me, you know, um, they know when to really 
unleash everything. And, uh, you know, I'm just right now I'm just I'm taking this week off and then uh, I'm going to let Keith and Eddie go to work, you know, and figure out who will be ne the next opponent. Yeah. OK, that's interesting that you bring that up, that you guys you feel you still be able to make that fight because, uh, yeah, when Canelo did that, that PBC deal, uh, a lot of people and even I was thinking like, well, damn, like that's the whole reason why Edgar signed with Matchroom was to get that Canelo fight. And then Canelo goes over there and I'm like, well, what is he going to do now? He can't get that fight. Nah, nah, yeah, we we bet we a hundred percent gonna get the fight. You know, it was it was either fight one fight and fight Canelo or fight two fights and fight Canelo. You know, we wanted to fight two fights and then fight Canelo. That's that was the plan. You know, to fight June, to fight again, and then fight next year, possibly May. You know, Canelo. So that that fight is there to be made. You know, my team is strong, man. I got one of the best managers in the world. You know. I got one of the best promoters in the world, you know, Eddie Hearns. And, um, you know, there, there's no black, bad blood with Eddie or, or, or Canelo. So, you know, obviously money talks, you know, and I, I'm their part of the end. So um, we definitely can make the fight happen. Um, that's not an issue. Like, so I don't want people thinking that, you know, you know, like, oh, you know, Edgar's, Edgar Belang is, you know, he's not getting that fight no more. Everybody thought about, you know, I was getting a fight. We still getting that fight. You know, like I said, man, we just we got the strongest team, so we're gonna make it happen. Is it something that it's it might be better that you get him a little bit later? Like it's like kind of perfectly aligning, like because he has these three fights with PBC, even though you're confident that you guys could go and do the fight. But say he does the three fights with PBC, and then he comes back, and and it's with you. I, I would imagine that probably the the more he waits, the more time you get to improve and mature as a fighter, right? Yeah, I, I just want I want to be on the street. I want those belts. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I feel like right now we don't gotta wait. I feel like right now we could get a fight. I know he's gonna fight. Uh, he's probably gonna fight Charlo. Yeah. Um, I think he's gonna fight Charlo. I'm supposed to be fighting in October. Um, and then right there is like, let's get it. Let's get it on. You know what I'm saying? You you just fought in September. I just fought in October. And for for us, it's like, all right, now we can get it on either in December, January, or May. Mm. Curious, uh, do you feel that Charlo fight is a tough fight for Canelo? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's gonna be a tough fight for him. Um, you know, uh, I I think stylistically, I think you know Canelo's gonna be the better man that night. Um, I feel like uh, you know him taking that two year layoff, and I know the weight got a lot to do with what was going on because I know he's a big dude. You know, he he, he gets big in between camps. You know, what I'm saying especially being two years off, so. You know, I think that'll play a major factor in the fight. Um, but there's a possibility that Charlo could win. You know what I'm saying? Like, but right now, I think I think uh, Kyle would be the better man. Yeah, that that's a like a concern of mine is that time off. Like, I, I would think like they would have said like, hey, no, he he needs to get a fight in. He's been two years off or going against a Canelo. But you know, a lot of people say like, hey, look, Canelo didn't look that good against Ryder. He he looks a little vulnerable now. Yeah. Um. Right is a tough fighter, you know. Uh, I think people people got a mistake and like Ryder came the best rider. Like Ryder, like our friends, like with Jason Quigley, right? Jason Quigley came the best Jason Quigley he's ever been in his career to fight against me. That's the same thing how John Ryder was. John Ryder came the best he's ever he's ever came as a fighter fighting Canelo. Like, he knew he was going to fight Canelo, so he came the best. He came the best in shape. He came the best prepared mentally, physically for this man. You know, people t tend to forget that. So, you know, when people say, like, oh, you know, Canelo's not the same or whatnot, maybe, you know, I, I see a little, you know, decline, just a little bit. Um, But, I, 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 you know, I take my hat off to, 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 to John Ryder. You know, he's a tough fighter. What way do you see decline? Is it something that you pick up on? Um, I say for me, I I just say like conditioning. Mm. You know, I just seen him like, like you know, he's he's declining in the later rounds. So I don't know if you know if he's you know not running enough or whatnot. I don't know, but uh, I just see like that that played like a major part, you know, in it as well. Why I feel like he couldn't stop him because I know he could have stopped him, you know, in the later rounds. I feel like he didn't have that tank to like really like step on him, just get that motherfucker out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people expected Canelo to uh, knock him out uh, that night. Um, do you ever watch Dragon Ball? Like, I, I equated it to, like, he's, like, charging. Like, Ryder had, like, so many moments where he's like, ah! Like, he got second yeah, yeah. wins like crazy in that fight. 
Yeah, um, I feel like too he ain't throwing up too uh right. I feel like when Ryder started throwing, he started landing. You know, I think he he didn't he didn't let his hands go as 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 much as he should. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how he deals with your power, man. The the other power puncher that he he went against was Golovkin, and yeah, yeah. for for years and years we've heard about these stories of Golovkin's power, and, and you know Canelo took that power well, but there were times where Golovkin catched him clean. Yeah, for sure. Um, Golovkin's power was on another level too. You know, a lot of the guys at one sixty eight got popped. You know what I'm saying? Um, maybe just our power is like you know just different. You know what I'm saying? Like little more than average, you get what I'm saying? But, you know, everybody got that that power at 168, you know, at that division, you know, everybody could punch. Yeah, you know, say, um, you know, th this fight does happen, but, you know, you said you can go back in the ring with the, the earliest at what time? Like, you feel October? Yeah. Yeah. So, for October, you mentioned Mungia. I, I know, like, Eddie and Oscar are kind of having this back and forth. Yeah. Uh, do you think that gets in the way of the fight? Maybe. Um, I think too, you know, you got the the fight that he just fought with Sergey. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Sergey's my stable mate, you know, Keith Conley manages him. So I know they pushing for, for a rematch. You know, so I, I was when I was calling on Mugia, I completely forgot that Keith was getting trying to get the rematch with, with Sergey and he's push he's been pushing for that heavy. So he's like, Yo, bro, I'm trying to get the rematch with Sergey because you know, people felt like Sergey won the fight. You know, did what you I'm think saying? he won? It was close. I thought I I I think I would have gave him the fight. Um, I just feel like what 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 threw him off and what made the judges, you know, give Mungia the fight was was that knockdown, and then him losing the last two rounds. You know, he lost the eleventh and twelfth. You know, and that's the most important rounds to win. Um, but I feel like he would have never got dropped. And if you know he would have came out strong the eleventh and twelfth, I think I think they would they would have one hundred percent gave him the fight. You know, but obviously. When he is the star, you know, he's the younger fighter. He's the guy that sells tickets. So, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to do their thing and they're going to, you know, mm. protect them and make sure that he got that, that that decision. So, you know, I know that Keith is pushing for that rematch right now with him and um, with Sergey and him. Because, you know, Sergey, you know, Sergey's my stable man and he wants, he wants to, he wants to run it back. So, you know, with me, I probably, I'm, for me, I probably just going to have to give my brother, you know, his shot again. Like, Yo, listen, man. You know, try to beat that motherfucker's ass, you know, maybe beat him up a little bit more and then give him to me, you know what I'm saying, later on. So, um, you know, but um, right now, you know, like I said, like right now we focus on uh, on October. Um, We still focus on getting this kind of little fight. Um, I know it's there. We could make it happen. You know, so I want to, you know, you recording this. I know it's going to go out to the world. It's going to be on YouTube everywhere. So everybody that's around the world, you know, that's listening, we can still make the kind of little fight happen without, with, with no problem. You know what I'm saying? I got the strongest team in the game right now. So, um, with Mungia, you watching the fight and seeing what Dervinchenko uh, was able to do, it, I feel like multiple times he stunned uh, Jaime, almost had him out. Uh, I want to say like in the middle of the fight. What happens in a fight with you and Mungia if you land those punches? Um, I get him out of there. Like I feel like those the shots that he land like. You understand, like I hit, I hit harder than 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 Sergey. You know, I feel like those right hands that he that he was hitting him with, well, my right hand, I think I would have put him out. You know, um, I just feel like, man, that that, that fight is definitely not going to distance, man, for sure, for sure. You know, I think um, that's an explosive fight. It's a big fight to make, um, and it's good for boxing. Yeah, man. That like I mentioned, it's a potential fight of the year, potential knockout of the year. Just knowing your style and his style, man, I I would, I would love to see that fight, man. Uh, hopefully, it does happen uh, sometime down the road. You mentioned October. There's so many players in your division, man. Say you know, things happen and the Canelo fight can't happen this year, and and Mungia does run it back with Dervinchenko. Is there anywhere else or or anyone else that you see like you know what? This is a big fight. This is a fight that fans want to see that interests you at all? Um, yeah, you know, you got, you know, you got all the all the guys, you know, you got uh Triple G, you got a uh, Ryder that's out there, you know. Um I'm gonna just take this week off, um, you know, and let Keith and, and Eddie handle everything, man, and you know, see who they bring to the table for October. You know, I wanna fight the best, man. I think it's about that time that, you know, we get in there and we just start 
you start testing myself. I feel like the better the oppositions, the better opponents that I face, um, you know, the, the better I become. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like I, I've been like that all my life. Like every time I feel like there's something that counts, it's like that's when I perform at my best. Like you, you raise up, you raise up to yeah, the yeah, occasion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure, thousand percent. Yeah, I know that was a big thing with you. Uh, I, I would imagine this is me just thinking um, that you felt you were maybe being held back a little bit by top rank uh, as well when they were matching you up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Like I want, I wanted the Canelo fight. You know, what I'm saying, boom, we left. Now we like on the verse, still making it happen. You see the difference? Like, I wanted those. I want those fights because I know, I know I can hang with those guys, man. Like, people gotta understand. Like, I came off a year layoff. I got the best quickly. That he like, I got the best quickly, the best, the best, the best, the best. If that quickly would have fought Boo Boo, it would have been a different outcome. I promise you. You know what I'm saying? If 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 the, the, the Terano, what's his name? Um, the one that beat him, Johnson. Yeah. If he would, if I would, he would have had that quickly. He would have beat him. So it's like it would have been a lot different, man. People don't understand, like. I came and I destroyed this dude. You know what I'm saying? I think they were saying like I broke his I broke his nose. Oh wow. You know, the next day he was like, he looked like a different person. You know what I'm saying? His face was just all bruised up crazy. Like it was just bad, man. And that just goes to show like the type of power that I have. <clears throat> yeah, what you know, would you I, what would you say, Edgar, then to like some of the people that say, Hey, you know, you're even though you're 21 and 0, you're still young, bro. Just wait, just just hang on. Mature a little bit more. Maybe you're not quite ready for like a Canelo or, or guys like that. Um, nah, man. I think it's the time. You know, I'm 26 already. Like this is the time where, you know, it's just time to just get it on. Now, you know, I'm not worried about. I never put in the back of my head like, oh my god, yeah, I'm gonna fight this guy, but I'm gonna take a hell. Nah, I'm going in there like, a fucking knock him out. I'm gonna beat the shit out of him. You know, I'm gonna win. And that's my mentality now. I feel like, like I said, like. I gotta understand that I'm the type of fighter like when I fight like good opponents where like like those type of like a kind of like a Mungia, like a triple G, I'm gonna rise to the occasion super like the fight that you see me before, you're gonna be like, where the fuck look like for instance, perfect example, Teofimo. Mm. When Teofimo fight for Lomachenko, nobody's seen that Teofimo before. He he rose to the occasion. You know, when he fights, you know, he fights that other guy, he fights his other dude, he looks like eh. And he fights Josh Taylor, the best guy at 140 that everybody was, was ducking, and he fucking destroys him. And that's how I am. Like, I'm just like that. Like, when I when it's, like, time to step up and really fight those guys, man, I'm just – my mind just goes to, like, another level. Like, I'm, like, out of this world. So. so let me ask you this. Based on that, man, um, when it's not an opponent that gets that reaction out of you, like, I, you know, what what causes that to to for you to – have like a subpar performance? Is it just like, oh, it's this guy, whatever, you know, go through the motions or? Yeah, not go through the motion, but it's like, it's like right now, like, for instance, were you right? If you get, um, if you get a guy that, you know, like you're gonna like oh, beat the shit out of this dude, then, you know, here comes a guy, one of, you know, uh, one of your, 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 your you know, Rivals or, or someone that like or rivals or somebody yeah, you've been that eyeing for a long time in the media business that, yeah. that that's the best like you that's mm -hmm. up there just like you that he has the same amount of followers just like you he's a media guy and he's that uh, any setback or something and he, he he walks up to you and he's like yo let's get it on your mom says like oh okay it's like a LeBron versus Kobe like mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying like it's like yeah. Two lines coming, you know what I'm saying? It's like they're gonna wake the fuck up like nah. Oh my god, you're gonna see a different game rather than LeBron versus uh, you know, uh, nobody in, in the NBA is gonna you're gonna see him play, he's gonna look good. Why oh, he's nice, oh shit, he's doing but then you see LeBron versus Kobe, you just start you just start seeing like spectacular things, you just start seeing things that special, like damn, I didn't even know fucking LeBron could do that. Damn, I didn't even know fucking. You know, I didn't know Kobe could do that, man. I got, but it was like the, he brought the best out of him, and I feel like me stepping up like that is they're gonna bring the best out of me. Mm, mm. Is there anything in particular uh, from this fight and maybe the past few months that you feel you got to improve on for the next fight? Yeah, um, I, I think I left off at a good at a good start. So the twelfth round is actually where I'm gonna start off in camp. 
you know, once I get back in the gym, man, like from right there, I'm just starting off. Like I feel like I unleashed a beast in, in the 12th round for sure. Like that right there made a mark. Like after that 12th round, I was I was a little upset. I was like, damn, they should have stopped it. I feel like they should have stopped it in the second knockdown when he took the knee. Cause for me that he was just that was quick right there. Like he was just, you know, he don't want no more smoke. You know, I feel like and I need, I touched him with a jab. I, I threw an uppercut, I missed the uppercut, and he just took a knee. You know, it was just too much pressure. And then when he got up, he just literally just started running around the ring. So I feel like the fight should have got stopped in the 12. Um, but you know, it comes to the territory, man. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I gotta ask you too, Edgar. Uh, us being fight fans, man, uh, I gotta get your opinion on uh, this Terrence Crawford Errol Spence fight, man. People are going back and forth. Some people say Arrow is just too much activity. He's just bigger. Other people are saying, hey, nah, Spence is a, uh, excuse me, uh, Crawford's a genius in the ring, his counter punching, his switch hitter abilities. Who do you got, man? And how does that fight go, in your opinion? Um, I got that fight at 50 50. Um, I just feel like they both, they both dogs, they both beasts. Um, I think the man that, that wins that fight is the man. The man's will, I think whoever has the strongest willpower, will meaning like that, th this and like this and the aggression and, 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 and the fight and how they're going to bring the fight. You get what I'm saying? And just, I think the will, whoever has the strongest will is going to win. You know, whoever breaks whoever's will. Um, And if for me, you know what happens if nobody breaks each other's will and what what was the decision a draw, you know? Um, but I don't I don't think it's gonna be a draw. I think it's gonna be an amazing fight. Um, so yeah, I think it's fifty fifty, man. May the best man win. Man, that'd be crazy if it was a draw. I didn't even yeah. think about the possibility of it being a draw. Yeah, for sure. You know, I and I say that because you know it's just it's two lines, bro. You know what I'm saying it's two guys that's eager to win, like. You gotta understand these dudes don't like to lose. So it's like if they do like you feel like they lost one round, they're so they're so competitive that it's like, yeah, I lost this round, but oh, I gotta win this round. And they win it. And then the person that lost that round is like, yo, I lost fuck, I gotta win the next round. Like that's how competitive they are. You know what I'm saying? So don't be surprised. And you know, fuck around and be a draw. Jeez, man, put money That'd on the That would be crazy, draw. though, man. That would be bad. That would be retarded. <laughs> but yeah, I would. Saying, like, there's that competitive, like, the competitive, like, how they are. They're so competitive, man. And, you know, when there's a draw, when a fight gets a draw, it's because two fighters are just so competitive. And they just, like, one, one in 21 round, the next round, the one, the another one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, the, the one thing, though, that I've heard people uh, say is that Crawford can't start late. Like, he can't allow Spence to kind of gain rounds on him in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, he got to he gotta be on point from the first round. Like, he got to come out and just go to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, he can't. Like, yeah, I know, you know, and you got to understand, like, Crawford's the type of guy, like, he'll probably give you the first three rounds, you know what I'm saying, just to figure you out, get his distance, check you out, test your power. You know what I'm saying? You touch him, see if you know what I'm saying, how your power is. And it's like I fly after the third round, I was like, all right, let me let me start, you know, let me start picking it up on this guy. If I were to get I, I've been asking this uh, to everybody. If I give you a thousand dollars cash and I go, Edgar, you, you can't run away, you can't spend this on anything, you gotta play you gotta place a bet. Either Crawford or Spence, who you who you placing that grand on, that G on. Oh, man. Uh... Moment of truth. <laughs> Jeez, that shit is hard, man. I yeah, I know. Five hundred, five hundred. Yeah. yeah, place it on a draw. <laughs> yeah, for real. It's funny. Cambosis actually uh, mentioned something about a draw too. He's like, "Hey, you see the odds for a draw? Like, be smart to put your money on that." Yeah, I'm. I'm probably better on the draw, man. See, see what it's <laughs> for, you know. <laughs> you know, finally, man, uh, Edgar. Uh, 168, dude, the, there, there's one guy that everyone talks about being the boogeyman, the monster. And I'm just curious what yeah. your thoughts are on this guy because I know you're a huge puncher in the division. What do you make of David Benavides and, and people labeling him the boogeyman of 168? Yeah, he's a beast. Um, That's another fight, too, that, that we could get, you know what I'm saying, that we can make happen in the future for sure. 
you know, um, I think he's a beast. I think me and him will be a crazy fight too. You know, just like, you know, Mungia and these guys, but for us too, we're young. You know, I think, I believe he's 27 or 26 years old. You know, um, well, 23, he's young. he's young. Yeah, 23. He's how? He's 23. No, no, he's who, 23, 24. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. he's still really young. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, shit. So, look at that. Yeah, man. Like, you know, that's the fight that, that definitely we can make happen. You know, I think that'll be a crazy fight, too. You know, he's Mexican. I'm Puerto Rican. You know how that go. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he's definitely a beast. For sure. Man, I, I miss going to the garden, the, the big garden, and hearing uh, the Puerto Rican crowds. I, I was there for a few Cotto fights, man. And it's, it's something different when, like, the whole – all the, the Boricuas, like the, the real fans show up and start getting yeah, into yeah. it, you know, with, with everything. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, I definitely felt the energy in there, you know, um, this past Saturday. Like, it was, it was it was just amazing. Like, walking out, you know, I, I walked out with, with my brother, Brian Myers. You know, he's a reggaetonero from Puerto Rico. He's Puerto Rican, big Latin artist. You know, I had, you know, all the bodies out, man. And it was just amazing. You know, I had a, I definitely had an amazing time for sure. Hey, who's the dream person you want to to walk you out for a fight? Is is there someone that comes to mind? Uh, I think Bad Bunny. That's what I was thinking too. I think yeah, <laughs> that'd I be think crazy. Bad Bunny. <laughs> I'll say Bad Bunny for like a Canelo fight. Yeah. You know, for a magnitude like that, like a big fight like that, I'll call up Bad Bunny. Like, yo, listen, I need you to walk me out. You know, let's sound big. Let's make history. That that'd be pretty cool, man. Uh, yeah. And we might see you in a wrestling ring because he's doing the wrestling thing too, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man, hey man, Edgar, great chat. Uh, thank That's you for uh, sharing the time with us. If you want to go ahead and close us out, a uh, special message there to to the fans and yeah. uh, special special message to everybody at one sixty eight. Also, um, first and foremost, you know, I want to thank my fans, the supporters, you know, the, my, you know non-believers um i love you guys man um you know the 168 division you know i'm ready for all the top dogs you know so we definitely after this week you know for this week off we're gonna start looking at who's who's next who's the next op you know that we about to you know light up smoke them up you know what i'm saying for october um yeah man and just keep out first you know all my all, all my supporters everybody around the world man jesus is king Always remember, man, he's amazing. Um, I got closer with God, uh, and I love all my supporters, man. Thank you guys for everything. That is Edgar Berlanga, still undefeated at 21-0. and 0. Edgar, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. That was Edgar Berlanga. Big ups to him, man. Cool cat, dude. I, I, I like uh, I like Edgar, man. He's he's cool. And if, uh, if that fight with Canelo does happen, um, him coming out with Bad Bunny – with that Titi song, oh man, that is gonna be wild, bro. Like, people are gonna go nuts. Um, if that happens, I don't know. It, look, look, with this whole Canelo, this is one thing. Like I, I was thinking with this whole Canelo three deal, three fight deal with PBC. Okay, one, it's 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 not crazy because they're about making big fights and making big money. You know, Eddie's the manager. Eddie gets his trainer cut, his his manager cut, you know. So they're looking for big fights, big events to be attached to. Uh, if it is three fights, given that year and a half, even though Edgar feels that, that he can get the fight a little later in the year, you know, it's, it's up to Canelo. I, I feel the team's going to want him to raise his profile more, Berlanga, in order to make that a, a attractive financial fight where they both make uh, a ton of money. And uh, th there's general massive interest uh, not only from the boxing fans but the, the casual fan base ab about this fight so i think uh, on that aspect uh, edgar still has some some work to do uh, certainly a mungia fight would uh, elevate that fight with david benavides a fight with some of these other guys at 168 pounds would go ahead and elevate him um but with that being said it, it, this this move from canelo might actually be beneficial to edgar you know edgar and i brought this up feels that he's ready uh, right now, but it, it gives them more time to develop. Uh, and, you know, we don't know. Three three fights is about a year and a half, two years uh, off of Canelo's career. And he's already, I, I believe, 31 uh, or 32. Uh, by the point when that's done, he's going to be close to 34, 35. Uh, and it, it could be the perfect timing for an Edgar Berlanga to come in uh, and, and fight Canelo 
on um, what maybe will be. We don't know. In two years' time, he could maybe still be top of the game, Canelo. Um, usually that's not the case the older you get, unless you're Bernard Hopkins and you're some freak of nature. You know, Canelo has a lot of wear and tear on him. Uh, and I say that uh, not because of how he's looked in the last few fights, but he's been fighting since he's been 15 years old. You know, all those miles, those hard days at the gym. And look, you know, it's it's the training camps and the sparrings are the brutal parts uh, for fighters. It's not the fight. The fight's the easy part, even though, yes, there are no fight is easy and there are fights uh, that are extremely hard. But it, if you ask any boxer, what's the hardest part uh, about being a boxer? It's the training and the discipline and the consistency uh, to keep all those three things together to be an optimal athlete uh, at, at the highest uh, level. Uh, uh, with that said, though, you know, this deal, man, it gets me thinking, like, what if this is like Canelo's like last hurrah, like last goodbye? Like this is his his farewell tour. He's going to go in, fight uh, Jermel, fight Jamal, fight Spence or Jermel, Jermel, David Benavides and, and and peace out. And that's it. He's done. Man, if he does that, what a way to go out. That's for sure. Imagine he goes Charlo, Charlo Benavides. Jesus, man, what a way to go out for reals. Like that's going out with a bang, but that's what has me thinking like, damn, man, is, is he already planning his, his exit way out? So, you know, the future is yet unwritten. I could only speculate. That's just me kind of like my spidey sense, my boxing spidey sense uh, going on uh, because of, of how old he is now. And, and he has all these other businesses going and you know, him talking about wanting to be a, a pro golfer also, or at least give it a try um, as well. But um you know, see what happens, man. We'll see what happens with that uh, Canelo situation. With that being said, I did promise this Teddy Atlas interview for the longest time. Uh, it's just been a timing issue, man. Like I mentioned earlier in the show, going through a move, as you can see, like the background's different. I, I got to set up my new uh, setup here uh, at the new place. So I haven't had a chance to to couple it. That, and I spoke to Teddy for an hour um, on two main topics. One, establishing a boxing commission uh, for boxing, a national boxing commission, as well as uh, the Spence versus Crawford fight, which we already released that clip. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, play and roll the clip. Teddy brings up some fabulous, fabulous points at, as to how this is beneficial, not only to everybody, but for the sport, um, to just kind of avoid these these just terrible decisions that we've been getting lately. And this is not a new thing. We, we've been getting... Boxing's always had its its slew of problems and, and it's just terrible decisions. But you know, I it gets to a point where and you know what? It's not even it gets to I, I think that point's already been reached for a long, long time already, honestly. Uh, but at some point you gotta put your foot down and, and attempt to do something because I, I've always said. The best part of my job covering the sport is to see dreams come true right in front of your eyes. And that makes me hopeful. Okay. That makes me hopeful because uh, I'm, I don't want to say at times, but I am cynical, you know, and, and seeing those things still makes me believe good things happen in this world and that good things do happen uh, to people that work hard uh, because there's been plenty of times where I've seen people get ahead in life, not because of their hard work, not because of the dedication and the talent and the skill they have, but it's because who they know in the right people they know and they get shortcuts you know it's happened to me personally where you know I, I i've been brought up my whole entire life to work hard okay to work hard to be dedicated to your craft good things will come and just i had a a sour experience uh with fox in terms of what shows i would work and what happened towards the last year of that fox deal which made me question all of that hey you work hard good things will come you know it's like yeah no not really it's network with the right people and good things will come. It's nothing to do with talent at all. Uh, but every time I see a fighter become a world champion or get that big win, it, it, it brings back that little chunk of wholesomeness uh, to me. But on the flip side, every time I see a, a fighter who's had the hard road up, who's not a big name, get these opportunities stripped away from them, it, it brings back that pessimism that's uh, the cynic in me 
Uh, and it, it's just terrible seeing someone's dream get ripped from them. Man, it's it's we see it a lot in boxing and it shouldn't be happening. Um, at least if it does happen, please allow it to be an even playing field when it's like a basketball game and someone loses uh, a, a championship match. Hey, had nothing to do with the judges, had nothing to do with the well, I want to say refs. some people would say, yes, it has something to do with the refs. But, you know, unfortunately, our 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 sport, there's three judges, three arbiters there that are watching a fight unfold and it's subjective it, it's and ultimately up to those, those three judges hold the fate of whatever fighter is fighting if they go to a points decision and you always hear people say do not let it have fate in your own hands get get the knockout but some guys just can't get the knockout that's just not their style they're just not haven't been gifted blessed with heavy hands uh to be able to get that uh but with the team thing like it, ultimately it's up to them but like you could do everything right, be winning a fight, and it gets taken away from you because of the judges, because inept uh, judges, and, and there's no accountability, zero, which is it just boggles my mind. Imagine if you're a mechanic, you're working on a car, and you do a, a crappy job, and your your boss is like, oh, whatever, you know, it's okay, they'll they'll live with it, you know, no repercussions, no, hey, why didn't you do this? Why did you score this this way? What were you looking at there? It boggles my mind that. How is it that fans and us in our position, okay, know more than these professional judges that get paid to judge fights at times? And, and you know, when I, I did my scoring uh, with Fox, I met a lot of the judges, okay? And, and I say this, the people that I met that judge fights from Nevada to Texas, California, Mississippi, New York, uh, Florida, all, all these places were... I was scoring fights and I spoke to the judges. I can say with a certain degree of authenticity, they care about their job and then they care about doing it well. Uh, but there are a few people that slip through the craps, uh, craps. <laughs> I'm thinking about Vegas craps, cracks uh, due to maybe, you know, they're just a little past their prime. Um, they're, they're older and in, incompetent. And, and, you know, Hey, it, it happens to everybody. You come to a certain age, you just can't do the job and perform under the stresses of that job at the high level, like you used to, it happens to musicians stop making music at a certain age it happens to actors. Uh, a lot of the times they get a certain age. They don't want to do movies anymore. Athletes over, you know, certain age limit. They can't perform at the highest dude. It's, it's the same thing with the sport, but at times they, those judges keep being used, used and used. So uh, we, we touch on what should be addressed to solve these problems uh, in boxing. So uh, with that said, man, uh, it's always a great listen. It's, it's always a great time chatting with Teddy Atlas. Uh, and he gets really, really passionate. I think this is something that could really solve the sport. Uh, though that cynicism that I talked about does creep in because when you think about the government, what comes with the new government agency? Usually, bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, a lot of, a lot of just dumb stuff. Things are slow to change. Uh, so that does creep in my mind if uh, a federal commission is founded. But let's go ahead and get to Teddy Atlas and see what he has to say uh, about all of this stuff. Uh, stay with us because this is a very, very great chat that I had with him. Check it out. Hey, Teddy, how's it going? Uh, great to have you on. It's It's been a few years since I've had a chance to uh, talk to you. You've had much success now with uh, your podcast and, and making a a good amount of news over uh, a topic that you brought up on your podcast, but something um, that you attempted to do a few years back with Senator McCain uh, is something I, I believe that me and you have talked to on uh, interviews in the past years and years ago, the start of a national commission. Uh, you started this petition uh, for it. Why do you feel that the time is right now, uh, given the current landscape of boxing? People are leaving, you know, Fans are leaving in the droves. That that remember that remember that movie years ago. It was a good movie. It was you're probably too young. It was Network. Faye Dunaway was in it. No, I, I had to see that movie for my journalism class. They they showed it to uh, us. I remember Network. Uh, yeah, good journalism class you were in. The the guy, the guy understood what it was about, and the guy came on the air. You know, having a little bit of a meltdown. I've had a couple. And he comes on and he says, listen, if you're fed up with what's going on, you got to say I'm as mad as hell. 
I ain't going to take it no more. Go to a window, open the window, put your head out. I'm as mad as hell. I ain't going to take it no more. Well, I'm as mad as hell. I ain't going to take it no more. But more importantly than me, I'm not that important. The people, the fans, the fighters, the ones that aren't making millions of dollars, the ones that get to the point where they have a chance to do what all fighters want to do, all people want to do in any vocation, make it for their family, make it for themselves. And they get to that place where they've earned the right to do that. And then they get robbed by these judges, by these callous, I'm sorry, I have to, but cowards, callous cowards, where they stand there and sit there with a pen and they go and they destroy their lives with a pen. And because of an agenda for themselves, because of a connection, an unholy alliance, quite frankly, where they're beholden to the people making money in the sport instead of the fighters, the athletes, which is their job, because they are administrators of the sport. But there is no, there's no walls. There's there's no system in place to separate church and state, where the people making money are connected now to the people that administrate the law, the rules for whatever they are. So between seeing what's going on for so many years, I've been in the business 50 years, and now seeing the continued impact of what it does to these fighters. And see, I know firsthand what it does. When a fighter gets that close, it's different than baseball. Now they got, now they got instant replay. Okay, you could rectify things. But before they had instant replays, a first guy goes to first base and he should have been safe. And he's called out. That's not good. But three innings later, maybe two innings, he comes back to bat to be able to make up for it. His life is not devastating. But you have a fighter who has worked to get to a certain point, and I watched it for 20 years, call him Friday Night Fights and everything else on ESPN all over the country. And you see these fighters that people wouldn't even know their name. But they got to that place, and they were ready to grab what they worked their whole life to grab, the world title to change them and their li- li- their families' lives. And it's ripped away from them. Now you know where they go? They have to go to the back of the line and face thousands of punches all over again to hope, to hope to get back to that place. And you know what? 99.9% of them don't get back to that place. The fighters that I remember crying, falling on the canvas, and, and I'm saying, oh, geez, this is horrible. He just got robbed. You never heard of him again. You wouldn't even, as I said earlier, you wouldn't even know their name. The general public wouldn't know their name if I mention it because they went into oblivion. And I've been fighting for 25 years on ESPN to try, my little part, to try to fix that. And it started with McCain or it led to McCain years ago. And I went down to Washington, met with him. We started to work to put together a national commission, the same way as that all the major sports have, to have oversight, to have rules, to have regulation, to have that separation between state and church, so to speak. And we were, we were moving forward, putting it together, put a draft together. He was trying to get it passed in the houses, and we kept hitting speed blocks actually walls and you know what the walls were coming from Hmm. i'll tell you i won't mention the personal name although i'd love to but i'll just say this that the walls came from senators and congressmen that were beholden to the promoters and it was public domain so senator mccain a good man he showed it to me he said this promoter is fighting it Obviously, he doesn't want change. He wants things as they are. And this congressman in this certain locale that we need on board, he received a campaign donation of a large check from these promoters. 
And, and that's it. I mean, you don't need an investigation to understand what that means. And meanwhile, those congressmen were stopping. They were impeding us trying to improve the business, trying to change the business, and trying to improve the lives of these fighters who risk more than anybody. Anybody, more than baseball players, football players, that's a rough sport too. But other than that, in UFC, I mean, every time they get in the ring, there's a matter of fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back on that. I was gonna say there's a good chance. Every time they get in the ring, they get out of the ring with less of themselves. It's just a matter of how much less, how tough the fight was. And those are the people that you're gonna do this to that that literally bleed, literally sweat and bleed for their profession to get forward. And, that, and that's who we're going to allow to be punished in this kind of way. So when we got to these roadblocks, I was like, I said, Senator, are you kidding me? I mean, you see, you saw the trade. He said, yeah, they, they, he got this particular congressman. He, he got campaign contributions from two major promoters. And what year right was now, this in, Teddy? What, what year? Uh, I, whatever. Teddy? It was before he ran for presidency because once he ran for president, a couple years before that, because once he ran so for the, presidency. The early 2000s. Yeah. Once yeah. he ran for presidency, it was over, obviously. Mm. Um, you know, he had bigger fish to fry, so to speak. But when, and then when they went through the motions, these politicians, as though they were, Thinking about it, they wanted to, they took the draft of this national commission that we were proposing and they showed it to the promoters to, to tweak it, to see if they approved of it. And I, I, it was just, I mean, I was, Senator McCain said, welcome to a new world, Teddy. I know you've been in a rough world in boxing. I understand. But you know what? This one might even be rougher. And you and when I was seeing this, and I and I said to him, and we laughed, but it was a it was a sorrowful laugh. It really was. I said to him, I said, Senator, you mean these politicians, these guys that we need on board, they took the draft, the proposal that we have to these promoters who if we put forward what we want to put forward will basically be out of business. And I said, that would be tantamount to taking a new drug, inform drug enforcement program and before you put it forward, you take it to the Medallion, what, I know I'm not pronouncing them right, but the Colombian drug cartels, Escobar, you know, all those guys, the names that everyone know, bring it to them and say, hey, guys, you want to tweak this a little bit? I mean, it's, it's even when I speak about it and repeat it, the absurdity of it, the, it it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's wow. mind-blowing. What, what was the, the, the name? So if people want to look it up online, I, I believe that the Freedom of Information Act, uh, you, you could bring up those documents. What was it formally known? In, in, did it make it to the House? No, it never made it. It, it made it. I don't know how far it made it. Yeah. Um, but every time it got to a consequential place, or potentially, it, it got knocked out. Mm. And we were going back and we formed a committee. It's kind of like a secret committee with school good people. Um, the former great friend and journalist Jack Newfield was on the committee. Um, there was a former New York Inspector General who's just a really good man who loved boxing who cared about he was a former fbi agent he was on it uh we had we had the right people on it and we would get together every week to go over a conference call with mccain and mccain's people his right hand man and we would go over the things and as we were trying to go through the checklist of you know okay we got to get this done we got bang uh, another thing would come and add three more problems to it, along the lines of what I'm talking about, with interference uh, from the people that you would want on board, not interfering. So while we were going through that 
wasted dance, if you will, um, all of a sudden, something called the presidency of the United States came up, and uh, and it was, you know, th that was it. So, it, just like that, it was so done. From, so, from what you guys had drafted up, how would a national commission work? And uh, did you guys make tweaks to this new petition? Have you had a chance to change anything? Like, how, how would a national commission work? We, <laughs> first of all, that old saying, be careful you don't get what you asked for. We had a couple giggles about that because as we were going and to handle it in a responsible manner and trying to, we said, we get to the point where we need a czar. We, we got to make sure it's the right guy. Because now you got one guy in charge of everything in the sport <laughs> instead of pockets of it. So that was, you know, a concern that we would have somebody absolutely with no ties to anybody in the sport. But we would bring in outside agencies to take over for the ranking committees to rank fighters, you know, maybe use a panel of international writers. There's one out there called the um, trans transnational rankings committee with 50 independent writers from all over the world. They do a good job. The problem is the good thing is they're not attached to sanction and fees. They're not beholden, you know, to the managers, to the promoters. They're, they're not getting their bread buttered there where they have to rank a guy that doesn't deserve to be ranked on his merit in the ring, but he's ranked on his merit with the relationship of the guy who's writing the check. By the way, I mean, some of these sanctioning organizations, the sanctioning fees, that alone makes them rich. But then you go to one of their, one of their seminars or whatever they call it, um, that they have yearly conventions, and always in a nice place, always in a plush place. And, and then the funny thing about it is, that they ask you to take an ad for time, an ad in their journal. I never saw such expensive ads. 30,000, 40,000, 20,000 for an ad. Yeah, you think maybe it's connected with all of a sudden after that convention, their fighter moved from number whatever to number a little higher? You think maybe, maybe. So we wanted to eliminate that. So we, again, bring in the logistics of it, the mechanics of it, the metric of it would have to be figured out to mm. further detail. But the the basic idea of it, bring in, bring in again, independent agencies to do that. Also, we, we need to separate where the people that are making money are that close to the people, again, I said it earlier, that administrating... The sport. I'll give you an example. When I when we were looking at the, uh, just the other day, I talked about it in the podcast. When I was looking at it and going over to make sure I was accurate when I was about to go on my podcast and put it out there, I was I was reminded of how startling it is, where Nevada Commission, which has been under recently for a bad decision, the referee stopping a fight two weeks ago, all of it, same old stuff unfortunately. And I'm looking at it and I see that their monies don't come from taxpayers' money. And people say, good, Fred, good. That's good. Yeah. Until you get to where it comes from. It comes from a tax put on. It's 8%, 6% goes to the state, 2% goes to the Nevada Commission to run the commission. That means to pay for the judges, to pay for the all the officials, actually, the refs, all expenses, all running, no different than any other business that you would have. That where they wherever the expenses, wherever the money comes to 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 run to cover expenses, the money comes directly from the promoters promoting shows. And the check, the check for their services, written and signed. By the promoters, is, is that absurd? I mean, if it's if it's beyond, if it's at the very least, it's a look of impropriety. At the very least, mm. can you imagine? I want to make it simple to people. So I said, here, just take this analogy. Could you imagine the night before? Uh, could you imagine the night before the 
uh, World Series game with the Yankees involved. And the Steinbrenners have to <laughs> sign the checks to the officials that are going to be working that game in the World Series with their team in it that they sign those checks. It couldn't happen. That's why you have a national commission in baseball, that you couldn't have that. You'd lose the credibility of this. Boom, bang, over. No credibility of the sport. Do you know how many dinners I have been at? A lot of them overseas, but a lot of them domestically, where I've been at a dinner and the night before, a big event, a big fight, where at the dinner is all the officials that are going to be basically deciding who wins. I know the fighters get in the ring, they decided. But if it goes to the scorecards and one guy doesn't knock out the other, then basically they're going to decide who gets their hand raised and who goes on with their career. So you're at this dinner, very large dinner, kind of like the Last Supper, and you have the refs, you have the judges, you have all the officials from the ranking organization, one of the alphabet soup organizations. You have all those officials there. And you know who the host of the dinner is picking up the check? Yeah, you got it. It's the promoter. And the promoter has his aides there sitting around, you know, they're hosting the dinner. And it's the best of everything. The best of wine, the best of, you know, uh, uh, lobsters, steaks, something called caviar, which I've never tasted in my life. I don't like raw fish anyway. And all of a sudden there's conversations on the side. Conversations like um, one of the judges talking to one of the, one of the promoter's aides and saying, listen, uh, my wife's coming in. Um, I was wondering, could I get another plane ticket? To bring her in, yeah. What? All right, no, yeah. Let's let's talk about it. We'll figure it out tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, my girlfriend's coming in uh, for the weekend. Could I get upgraded to a suite? You know, I'd like to be in the suite. I'm a little tight. She's coming in. I didn't think she was coming in. Yeah, these are things you've okay. heard. These are yeah, things you've right overheard. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, right there, firsthand. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about them. And there's such a mm-hmm. such a serious thing. Uh, you know, can. Can I extend my room, you know, for a couple of days? Me and my wife would like to stay a few extra. Such a beautiful place. We'd like to stay a couple of extra days. Listen, if that's not out and out graph, I know that people are a little bit um, in their minds when they think boxing, they think about corruption as far as being from the movies, where it's in a cigar-filled room with a stuffed envelope, envelope of cash going under a table with a guy with a cigar in his mouth. Yeah, you know, take care of the guy. Make sure he goes down in fives. You know, all that kind of stuff. That stuff actually did happen. There was something called the Keith Alpha investigation back in the 50s, actually to help eliminate that. But now it happens in a different way. It happens in a way I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be in that way. That, I mean... At the end of the day, it gets you to the same place. It gets the same results. And again, the the people making the money are the people that are keeping the commissions. Forget about the judges. The commissions, they're keeping them in play. They're keeping them in business. So if the promoter doesn't promote fights because his guy ain't winning enough and he does less fights, the commission makes less money or maybe not enough money to even stay in existence. Or the, the, if, a, if a fighter doesn't win, that brings more revenue to the state, to the casinos. It goes far. It goes, it, it, it's not a short thing here. Then that fighter doesn't win. Oh, there's less revenue, less revenue. Coming in, like the fight the other night with Lomachenko with Haney. Okay, yeah. mm-hmm. well, people say try to figure it out. Why would they favor Haney? Uh, it was a close, close enough fight, but the one judge, which there's no explanation except what I'm talking about, Moretti, Dave Moretti. That's right, I said his name, Dave Moretti. Yeah, he had it eight four Haney. He had it 
Yeah, he had a 116-112 any. But here's the thing. Here's the smoking gun for me. Mm-hmm. If you're in a court of law, exhibit A. The rounds were close. There were two rounds that were not close. Nobody will argue. The 10th and 11th, Lomachenko separated himself. He dominated the 10th. Some people thought he was on the verge of stopping him. He got to him. He got And give Haney credit. He behaved like a champion. The 12th round, he came back. Okay. But in the 10th round, the round where you can't argue who supposed to get that round, Moretti is the one judge that gives it to Haney. Gives it to Haney. And then another thing you can't argue, Haney got off to a better start and won. They were close, but you could say won some of the more of the early rounds. And there's no argument. Loma came on. That's why people thought he won. Loma came on and won most of the late rounds. Well, look at his scorecard again. Look at Moretti's scorecard. Five of the last six rounds he gave to Haney. How do you explain that? How, how, really? And how is a commission not immediately saying, uh, Mr. Moretti, I'd like you to be in our office, 8 o'clock Monday morning. We will have a panel, an oversight panel here. We will replay the fight. And we'd like you to explain to us how you came up with these scores. If not, uh, we will be handing you a slip that's pink. And um, we will say, you know, thank you for your service. They're no longer wanted over here. Yeah, yeah it's a strange I mean, thing, Teddy. Like whenever we try to question the commissioners, they or or the refs or the judges, uh, ringside or after these events, they always decline interviews. They ever they don't ever want to talk, um, and we never really get transparency if they are reprimanding or asking the judges, "Hey, let's sit down and score this again. Why did you come to this?" And if they do come to a conclusion that that person is incompetent or getting older or just not seeing the fights correctly that they get bumped off assignment. We never see that ever. No, that's the problem. There's no accountability. That's the problem. There's no system in place to demand, you know, mandate accountability. I mean, anywhere else, just about in the free world, there is. But not, you know, not in boxing. And that was another thing, the National Commission, you talked about how it would lay out. Yeah, I... I want to put something forward where we would judge the where instead of by their cozy relationship that they get jobs, that they would get it by a rating system. If they the higher rated, the more work you get. The lower rated, the less work. And then we would have training centers where seminars where you go to for proper training for the criterion of how to train. I mean how to judge a fight and you to try to help you help you guide you to what is the proper way to judge a boxing match and and to referee a boxing match so all of these things another thing that we had in play and i would want to play now if if this petition i put up there takes off um we got two hundred thousand views in a little over a day on the podcast and we got right now about 6,000 or 7,000 signatures. Yeah, and we let, let keep us going. know also, Teddy, uh, how uh, what's the, the web address? And I'll put it in the link in the description when I put this out, but what is the uh, You really are talking to a caveman, so you're going to have to figure that. <laughs> I, I love you for putting me on here. Thank you. <laughs> but full transparency, brother. Uh, don't worry, guys. I'll, I'll put the link up. I'll put the link up. Right. For you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know my uh, my my wife says to me often, "Thank God you know boxing because <laughs> there's so much you don't." Know. And I say, "Yeah, okay. Thank God. I'm 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 thankful for that." Well, let, but, let me um, ask you this then, uh, because let me tell you one thing. It. I was going to yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah 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 yeah. One of the things that if we get our way and we get a national commission, we get in front of the congressman, which we're doing. We're, we're, we're setting up meetings to get in front of the congressman. If we get this done, another component of this national commission will be something that all the other major sports have, and we don't have it. And we're the, fight, we're the sport where the athletes are most at risk. We just talked about that. And you know what that is? A pension plan. Yeah, retirement. A pension plan. And where you put a, and we figured it out. It wasn't that hard. 
put a 2% tax on the mega promotions. <laughs> Some of these promotions, like the one that was a crossover, I get it, but it was uh, Mayweather and McGregor. One fighter got, I think uh, Mayweather got 300 million. I think McGregor got 120 million, whatever. But the universe of money's everywhere was close to a billion dollars. 2% of that, you know what? That goes into the pool for pension plan. And all the other mega fights, Pacquiao and Mayweather, whoa. I mean, that was so much money. The internet almost broke while people were trying to order the pay-per-view. So again, 2% goes into a pool and we'll figure out the metrics of it later on. Yeah, how many, how long you had to be a pro, how many fights you had to have, what your purses were, all of that. But and and comprehensive health insurance. These fighters don't have health insurance. And another thing that would be part of it, if we could get this done, and and all of it's important, but it starts with getting rid of the word corruption, or even the thought that people. You know how many people say, "Teddy, I I, I love your sport. I love you." I say, "Thank you very much." Not too many people do, but I. But I'm I'm done. I'm done. I can't take it no more. <laughs> I'm done. I it's I'm just sick and tired. It's it's like watching a movie, and you already know the ending. <laughs> you know you know they're gonna rob the guy, and and you you just don't you know you don't want to see that. You don't want to watch the, and then you're gonna see that. I mean, like what what what's what's the use? So before the sport gets diminished more, and it is it's being diminished. But before it gets diminished anymore, before any more fighters have to be, as I said, forced back to the back of the line to face thousands of punches again to get back to where they can take care of their families. We're trying to get it. We're trying to get this done so it can really invoke invoke real change. You know, because uh, you brought it up, uh, the, this Haney Lomachenko fight, and I know you covered it on your podcast. But since then, there's been a, a lot of fighters that have said they rewatched the fight and they agree that Devin Haney uh, won the fight. Uh, curious, did you rewatch no the fight at all? Yeah, I watched it. I said on my podcast, I don't have a problem with the final decision. I thought either way, I could have gave it a point to Loma, a point to Haney. No problem. I could have made it a draw. No problem. Haney won the 12th round. And saved, saved his title probably by doing it. No problem. What I do have a problem with is the disparity in scores with the largeness of the score of Moretti, with the 10th round of Moretti, with five of the last six rounds with Moretti going to Haney, who did not win those late rounds. That's, that's where I have the problem. And that has shown up time and time and time again. You know, it's kind of like... You go, you go to the butcher and you say, give me a pound of ham. And he's always weighing you light, you know? And he's, after a while, you're like, is this an accident or is he chiseling me? You know, he never weighs me heavy where he gives me an extra quarter of a pound. It's always light. It's always light in boxing. When they stop a fight like they did, Tony Weeks did, what, two weeks earlier? And they stopped a fight. They stopped the fight when the house fighter looked like he might be in danger of losing a fight. And they stop it on the opponent's side. They never stop it on the other side. And I asked the public in that podcast, and, and everybody resoundedly was like, that's all you need to ask. I asked him if it was reverse roles, and it was the house fighter, the promoter's fighter that was in that position, would the referee have stopped? No, Teddy wouldn't have stopped. There it is. There it is. And again, no, was it a terrible robbery? No. Mm -hmm. But what was terrible was the continuation of what I'm talking about. The pattern, the ability for a judge to be able to impact a fight because of his possible relationships, possible relationships, coziness with a certain promoter, a certain fighter, a uh, certain manager, certain entity. I mean, it shouldn't even be plausible. And, and I started to say earlier, 
people were saying, Teddy, both these fighters were with top rank. And Haney was, I believe, in his last fight of his contract. So mm-hmm. he's going to be a free agent. And Loma is still over with top rank. What is the a good question? What is the incentive here? Yeah, why would you give it to Loma? He, Loma's the top yeah. rank guy. And, and yeah. he's leaving. Why, shouldn't and then, the decision and then once Loma I said, A hundred percent. And once I said it, people were like, oh, yeah. Loma's 35 years old. Haney's 24. Loma's got, what, three losses now. He's not American. That, that's not a knock against my love. But, you know, he doesn't speak the language fluidly. He's, he's a little harder to promote. Um, as I said, he's 35 years old. He's a little longer in the tooth. You know, he's on his way a little bit out the door, a little bit. And Haney's 24 years old. He's undefeated. And there's a lot of mega fights at lightweight or junior welter, but lightweight. That's what he's at. Mega fights, whether it's Tank Davis or whoever, that can be made that can bring in large amounts of money into the state of Nevada. A lot more than Loma can bring. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I mean, kind of like kind of like Hyman Roth said in the original Godfather, when he said to Michael, Michael, it's not personal. It's business. It's business. And, and, and it, when I laid it out that way to people, they were like, it's business. You're right. It's the only decision you can make if you want to stay in business. And believe me, they want to stay in business. Wow. Uh, man, I have so many questions, Teddy, on, on like the, the commission um, and just like the structure. And okay, first thing is so for the other sports, the NFL, the MLB, NHL, their commissions, how are they funded? Where are they getting their money from? Uh well revenue, I mean yeah I I am not an expert on there you know I, you and know, I asked because I would I would think sports. like you're you're I mean television I base television model, revenue right? I would say yeah television merchandising it's mm-hmm. huge in the NFL yeah um you know uh, uh obviously gates uh at uh, at stadiums that have eighty thousand seventy thousand people and the prices keep going I mean. There's so many streams of revenue. I don't know exactly, again, what the metrics are with it, but that's a good start. I mean, you'd have to ask somebody who truly is an expert in in the NFL as far as how it works. But I know another thing that we were looking to propose with our National Commission, once we got some, the oversight, the, the framework. The, yeah, the framework in the federal just the federal government, somebody where they run it, where they keep us isolated from all the stuff we've just been talking about for the last half hour. Merchandising. All the other major sports have merchandising. The the fighters, the, obviously it's the fighters with the bigger names, but those, those shirts, those hats, they bring a lot of money when you go in to the MGM for the big fights. And and people and the lobby is packed and people in there spending sixty dollars, seventy dollars for a hat, for a shirt. That that's another thing that should, can go into the pool here, you know, where it can pay for things like pensions and and you know, medical coverage, as I said, across the board. Uh, for the for the fighters here, look, this much of the fighters make the big money up here. They're okay, but then there's this much a huge amount down here that people would be shocked if they saw the poultry purse, $5,000 a fight, $10,000 a fight, $30,000 a fight to go in there and, and everything. I mean, I know that's how you build yourself up, but that that's what we're talking about. Those, that's where the inequity is. Those are the fighters that really this would, serve the most because quite frankly the rich guys they're they're with the kingmakers they're protected <laughs> because, because they're with the guy on corner shots they're with the guys that basically are running this thing so they're okay you know but the other ones they're not 
and somebody's got to look out for them because they are, I don't know, without them, you, you can't get an undefeated record, can you? No. Mm. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get these gold medalists from the Olympics that had 200 fights and they're terrific, they're fast, and all that. You can't get them to 20 and 0 without those other guys. And they make up 85% of the game. I mean, maybe it's 90. Maybe it's 90. I don't think there's more than 10% that's at that, you know, high elite level that we're talking about. So 90% or somewhere is about, you got guys that they, they're not, they're, they're not in that club. They're not, they're not in that club. And um, they need to be, you know, they need to be protected too. So I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about like how a commission like this work independent of, of what you're bringing up. And, and I always came to like, okay, there has to be a national head and then it's, it's set up by regions, kind of like, I don't want to say corporation, but like, you know, someone in, ahead of the West coast, head of, of middle of the country, head of the East coast, uh, maybe even like, kind of like how the Supreme court has like, how like all these States have Supreme courts, like a Supreme of, of that region that they all report to the national czar uh, the interesting thing, though, I, I think that a national commission would dissolve the sanctioning bodies, I, I, I would assume. Or like, what would happen to the sanctioning bodies? Uh, have you given thought? Like, my, my thought was like, well, the national commission would now be the ones ranking people and mandating fights. And like, given that, like, there would be no point for the sanctioning bodies, right? Good, good news. Good news. Good news. Yeah, good news. Because that's a chunk. You know, I'm not going to go overboard here, but that's a chunk of what we're talking about. The, whether you want to call it just getting things wrong, incompetence or corruption, whatever you want to label it. You know, I remember my mentor, Customato, smartest man I ever knew in boxing, dedicated his whole life to the sport. I remember he said to me one day, he said, Teddy, the only explanation for the stuff we're talking about is either incompetence or corruption. And then he would he would cap it by saying, and nobody could be that incompetent. <laughs> over and over and over and over again. So, and again, the system, the sport and its system has been frankly built to be corrupted. I mean, human beings are corruptible. I hate to tell you, I mean, it's, you know, some of us are better than others. You know, we're a little better. And we try to be better, I hope, every day. And more honest and stronger and less selfish and more selfless. We try. It's a battle. Because human nature is to take care of yourself. I mean, you know. And if you give someone an opportunity to say, hey, there's an extra little something over here for you. If you close your eyes, maybe, you know. Sleep during three rounds. Just take a little nap. You've been up, you know, early. Take a little nap during a couple rounds, you know. And, and if you look at the patent, which I've chronicled over the years on my podcast, but some of these patents of some of these fights that really were robberies, out and out mm -hmm. robberies. I mean, nobody would argue. You go back in the history and you look at some of them, there's a patent. It's unbelievable. It's a patent where early on, even if they're not winning, they're giving rounds to the house fighter, to the fighter that's supposed to win, let's say, right? They're giving rounds to him. And then later on, they're giving rounds to the other fighter, to the opponent, to bring it tighter. But they already built up their cushion where they're safe. <laughs> where, where you can see it. You look at it, you say, oh, my God. And, and so they got a cushion where they're safe. And then they start to close the gap. So someone will say, oh, yeah, they had it competitive. They had it the way they were going to always have it, where it looked, the perception of it was the way they wanted the perception of it to be, where they basically did a crime with gloves, with, you know, with, in other words, not leaving fingerprints. That was, that's their way of putting latex gloves on and not leaving fingerprints. Tighter. And and some of the rounds you say that the opponent who did get robbed, he didn't win. He, he didn't win this late round, but they gave it to him to bring it closer. And then there was one, I can't remember who they were, but it was almost comical. 
I'm breaking it down. I called that episode on my podcast Anatomy for a Fix. Eesh. You heard Anatomy for Murder. This mm-hmm. was Anatomy for a Fix. And I'm explaining it. And this particular card, that pattern was going on. And then they they were tightening it up. But then all of a sudden, they got it a little closer than they really calculated. And it was like the stretch run, like three rounds, whatever it was. It was and it was getting too tight. And all of a sudden, they said, break it. They had to now give it to the house fighter. And the house fighter was blatantly, I mean, right in front of you, you could see he lost those rounds. Mm. But they they got it. They they let it get too close. They were a little asleep at the switch, a little bit. Where oh my and 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 I you know I I obviously I was making fun of them a little bit, and you know sometimes yeah, I can't help it. Uh, I'm trying to get my point across, and I know it's not always nice, but what they're doing isn't nice. So you know I I, I said. Oh, can you imagine this judge? He, he let it get close, freaking. We got this. This is good. They're going to say I had it a two point, one point fight. And I, nobody's going to look at nothing. And then all of a sudden, oh, geez, if I give these rounds to him now, was he won? He's going to win the fight. Whoa. <laughs> and real quick, he, he's rectifying things with that little pencil. So there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, the other thing, too, though, there's so many things. Like, why don't they give these refs a, a monitor also? Because there's a lot of blocked vantage points. Why don't they give them, you know, ear coverings so they're not affected? That was the one of the noise? things that's going to be in the proposal. You know? Put, use use what's available. Yeah. Put a monitor here. Because you hear these refs, I think it's a poor excuse. But all right, it sounds valid sometimes. I couldn't see from that angle. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Put a monitor here so you can see from all yeah. panoramic. I, I never understood all. why they never did that. Like when I scored fights for Fox, like I would always see judges missing things. And I'm like, why don't they just give them a monitor? Like you, it's blocked. Look at them. Look at the monitor. You're not blocked anymore. How they're about back this to your one? vantage point. You're they're there, you know? 100%. How about this one? How about it's the only major sport that... Nobody knows the score until the end. The end. Think yeah. about it. Yeah. How about op- how about putting up open scoring? Do you think it's always harder to do things in an open light <laughs> than it's always hard? It's harder. But to the, pull the off- argument, though, Teddy, for open scoring is if a guy is ahead too much. And I don't. I, I don't. I'm not saying I agree I with it or not. But yeah, you know, they they always bring I it up. The guys, yeah, I got an answer. Football. The score is up on the scoreboard last I checked, right? Mm -hmm. And a team's way ahead. And they do. They do go into preventive defense. They do. And it changes the game. There's no doubt about it. Part of the game. Part of the game. That's their choice. The coach says, okay, we're going to go into prevent defense because we're so far ahead. And then they start catching up. Holy. All right, now we got to go back. You know, to what we were doing, it's part. It's, it's part of the game. W- would you rather? <laughs> I almost left. Would you rather in a football game where the teams didn't know the score? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't. It can't work. But it 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 happens in boxing. It happens in box. Yeah, there'll be so. You're right. Right on the mo- money. There'll be certain trainers that are saying, "All right, take off on the bike and let's go. We got this fight." It's ours to win or or ours to lose. It's up to us. We're we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna stay in exchange with them. Let's get on the bike and move. I don't care if they boo, whatever. Okay, so you go on the bike. Now you're in the other corner. All right, cut the ring down. You don't have to worry so much about incoming now. Go get him. Go to the body. Take some air out of the tires. As I used to say when I was doing all the ESPN fights, and go and get him. You don't have to worry no more about getting caught with punch. He ain't standing his ground no more. He he's he's putting a welcome mat out for you to be aggressive. Be aggressive. You got five rounds. Go get him. And you know what? That's a different kind of intrigue now. That that adds to a whole different 
dimension of looking at a fight now. I think you've resold a bunch of people on open scoring again, Teddy. <laughs> but it's true. You know, you, you bring up a good point. We see that all the time in sports. When there's a blowout, there's a blowout. Like, you know, it's, there's, it's another thing that's like kind of odd too is like just the transparency of that. You know, if the scores, you never know what what score you're going to get as, as a fighter coming into a fight, which is, you know, it's, it's unfortunate to be honest. All right. That was Teddy Atlas, man. Uh, thank you so much, Teddy and all of our guests uh, for joining us at Virgil Ortiz, uh, uh, Edgar Berlanga, man, a uh, lot to digest there. Um, what do you guys think? Good idea, bad idea. Uh, sound off on the comments section and, and let me know. This is something that I thought about for a very, very long time, but it's only, it's, it's going to take you guys, the, the boxing fan base uh to really put pressure um on on the government on, on your your elected officials to bring this up and, and to really push it through uh for change uh in this sport and like i mentioned that it's it's needed because of what i was saying prior to a lot of these bad decisions come down to incompetence uh as teddy was saying corruption uh, as well. So uh, I'll put the link uh, in the description to sign that petition. Um, this chat's a few weeks old. It's just been a scheduling thing, man. Uh, and I apologize to Teddy uh, for it taking as long as it has uh, to get it out. Uh, but go ahead and, and click on the description of this video. Uh, fill out that petition uh, for a federal uh, commission. With that being said, man, action this weekend, uh, like I mentioned, Virgil Ortiz, uh, July uh, 8th, this Saturday, uh, taking on Iman Testeñones. Teron Ennis returns to the ring, uh, taking on Roy Iman uh, via the, the guy that stopped uh, Rashidi Ellis on the uh, Javante Davis undercard. So those are the two fights. There's a UFC fight as well this weekend. Uh, Volkanovski, I, I believe, and Brandon Moreno uh, is going to be in action as well. So... Uh, a lot of good fights, uh, a lot of good action to check out this weekend. I'll check back in with you guys next week. Got to work on some guests. We'll, we'll go ahead and break down these fights that are happening on Saturday. Uh, as always, man, appreciate the support. Thank you so much for uh, rocking with us, really. Um, I don't know where this show's going, but I hope it goes to the moon. <laughs> but please go ahead and follow us. Um, support, hit the like, comment below, interact with us, follow us. On Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at Fight Up TV. Go ahead and give me a follow as well at Hey, it's Marcos V on the tweets. All right. With that being said, man, be safe, be happy, stay positive. Uh, check in on your loved ones. Tell your friends you love them. Tell your parents, your family you love them, and try to spend as much time as you can uh, with them. Don't ever get too busy to not reach out to uh, your loved ones, man. Um, that's uh, that's for sure. So uh, with that being said, on behalf of the Fight Up TV team, thank you so much for watching and see you guys next week.